Hello there. Um, greetings from beautiful Curaçao. Um, I'm uh, speaking to you from my hotel room. Um, it's a shame uh, you cannot be here because it's really nice. Um, but uh, for now, I hope to tell you something about um, my article in uh, this video. Um, the article is called Privacy Preserving Anti-Money Laundering Using Secure Multi-Party Computation. It's an article that I wrote together uh, with my colleagues and with uh, two colleagues from Dutch banks that we uh, collaborate with. Uh, my name is Maribeth van Egmond, or Maribeth. Um, I'm a researcher at uh, TNO. TNO stands for the Netherlands Organization for Applied Scientific Research. And uh, in this article, I present a privacy preserving solution for collaborative money laundering detection. And um, as in the title, we'll be using secure multi-party computation. Um, and we do this using homomorphic encryption. And through this presentation, I will be mainly talking about um, homomorphic encryption. But then you know that the background is that we actually do a secure multi-party computation protocol. Um, in this article, I present two results. Uh, the first result is uh, the potential of uh, an anti-money laundering algorithm called risk propagation um, that we tested on real bank data um, of one of our uh, partners uh, in this project. Um, and uh, the second result is a secure version of this risk propagation algorithm that enables banks to col do collaborative transaction monitoring using an additively homomorphic encryption solution. Uh, so let's go to the first result, uh, risk propagation. What's risk propagation about? Well, uh, a few years ago, there came a question from our partners and they said, how can we follow risky money? For example, large amounts of cash in a transaction network. Well, let me give a very small example of um, what that risky money could look like. So in this picture, you see three bank accounts, bank account A, B, and C. And in this scenario, bank account A and B receive uh, a large amount of uh, cash. And after they've received this amount of cash, she doesn't receive anything. Um, they send um, also a large amount of money to account D, and C also does that. Um, and then you could claim that account D receives indirect cash or indirectly receives cash and um, well this very small example is inspired by well-known money laundering patterns uh, the so-called scatter scatter or get, uh, scatter gather patterns where uh, risky money or in for example large amount of cash get obfuscated by going through a lot of accounts and then coming together again at um, one account um, so in this scenario, you, you could uh, want to know the fact that D accounts indirect cash, uh, that e account D receives indirect cash. Um, well, how can we know that? Um, for this, we translate this received cash into numbers. So in this case, it's a cash ratio, where very simply, in this case, account A gets ratio 1. Um, B, B also 1, C 0, and D also 0, because they didn't receive any cash. In um, a real-world scenario, of course, this is, in our article at least, it's a number between 0 and uh, 1. Um, but in this case, we say A and B only received cash, and C and D didn't receive any cash. So when these uh, transactions happen, we might want to update the score um, a risk score or a cash score, whatever you want to call it, um, of D into some number that resembles this scenario. But we could very simply do that by uh, taking the weighted average of the current risk score and the weighted incoming risk scores, um, where the current risk score is zero and the incoming risk incoming risk scores we take the average because the amounts are um, uh, the same, uh, so the average is two thirds. Um, so if we take the average with the current score, we get one third. Um, and if we gen so this this one third resembles the fact that the um, received indirect cash. And if we translate, if we um, 
I generalize this, then we get some linear function um, that takes in uh, amounts and um, the current risk score and the incoming risk scores. Uh, and this is a linear function that uh, calculates the updated score of account D. Um, I won't go into the exact details of this function. It's not that complicated, but for now it's important that this is a linear function with these inputs. Um, well, so we have a linear function that calculates the updated score um, and uh, by using the amounts and the initial scores. Uh, in this way, we can update every risk score in the transaction network, um, and we can do this over multiple transactions, uh, multiple static networks using multiple iterations. So we, um, we use this function multiple times so that we get also an idea of some flows into the network. Um, well, this is what we have done and uh, gives us result one, uh, which is the potential of risk propagation for anti-money laundering. Um, and we tested this algorithm on a few million bank accounts of uh, a large Dutch bank. And what we did is we gave every account a suspicious activity report label, um, zero or one. This, and we, we tried to predict these labels using the initial cash scores and using the propagated cash scores. And uh, well, if you try to predict that, you can make a precision recall curve. I uh, won't go too much into what the precision recall curve does, but um, here you can see the result. So we see the result of trying to predict with the initial cash course, which is the blue line, and trying to predict with the propagated cash course, which is the orange line. And um, if you look at this specific point in the precision recall curve, we see that for a recall of 20%, so when 20% of what you want to detect, in this case, these suspicious activity report labels, um, when 20% gets detected, um, then the precision doubles. So that means that your result is more precise. And this is a reduction. This means a reduction of false positives. Um, well, this is, of course, nice to see that um, with these propagated cash scores, we can better predict these labels. Um, but you could also see that this um, model is not perfect yet. A uh, recall of 20% might be not so um, large, but um, what we can claim is that this can be useful as a feature um, amongst other features in um, transaction monitoring. So it's not meant as something that the only thing that you can use, but in um, transaction monitoring, a lot of features are used and this could be an extra feature there. Um, and should also be researched um, further in the future by the banks. Um, okay, this is very nice result. So we have the potential of some algorithm for uh, anti-money laundering. Um, but you might wonder now, aren't we at a financial crypto conference? So where's the crypto? So here it comes. Um, if we look at this scenario, uh, someone tries to obfuscate uh, risky money uh, or cash through um, many accounts, then you can probably imagine this won't happen within one bank, uh, but will probably happen on multiple banks. So, for example, account A is at the orange bank, B and C are at the green bank, and D is at the blue bank. Then, um, in general, banks have a limited view on the network. So in this case, bank three, the blue bank, uh, sees the transactions coming from A and B and C, but doesn't see what is behind A, namely uh, a large cash transaction. And it might want to know. It might want to know the fact that D receives indirect cash for its transaction monitoring. Um, so. Banks have a limited view on the network. However, for this risk propagation algorithm, 
sort of the linear function where we put in amount uh, and risk scores, we can see here that um, the only thing that uh, is missing for bank three to calculate the updated risk score are actually the risk score of A, the orange one, and the risk score of B and C, the green one, because the amount bank three already knows. Um, so how can we uh, solve this problem? Uh, well, the ideal, f ideal functionality would be to have a trusted third party um, that, that receives the risk scores and uh, calculates the updated score and reports back the updated score to the, uh, to the parties, to the banks. Um, however, this trusted third party is not always possible or legally um, allowed or available, could be expensive. Um, or could be uh, not fully trusted. Um, so that's why we came up with a secure multi-party computation or homomorphic encryption uh, solution uh, that we call secure risk propagation, where we use actively homomorphic encryption. So the question is, how can banks perform risk propagation without needing to share privacy-sensitive data, which, is these, which are these risk scores? Um, well, uh, risk propagation uh, is very suitable for homomorphic encryption. Why? Because it consists of uh, linear operations, as we have seen. Um, also, uh, a bit of a non-technical side point is that it is easy to explain, um, which in our experience helped a lot um, to talking with uh, legal people. Um, for example, at the moment we are setting up a pilot, so it's good to mention that we are in a early research phase on um, researching this together with Dutch banks. Um, but we are setting up a pilot and uh, for this we need to explain to legal people from the banks um, on what is actually happening and then it really helps that you have this um, simple simple to explain algorithm and not something which, of which you say like, ah, uh, we have a super complicated algorithm and this is the result. Um, and then the third point, as you already saw in the previous slide, um, the only thing missing to calculate the updated risk scores are actually the uh, incoming risk scores. Um, so there's no need to encrypt the entire network, only the risk scores of the incoming accounts. Um, so short note on additively homomorphic encryption that you probably already know. Um, additive homomorphic encryption makes it possible to compute with encrypted values. Uh, and what happens, as you can see in the blue block here, is that um, actually uh, multiplications become sums and powers become multiplications with integers. Uh, so we can easily translate the um, linear function that we had, the updated risk scores, um, score uh, being calculated by function f, uh, we can translate it into a um, formula where you put in the amount and encrypted risk scores and you get out encrypted updated risk scores. Okay, so once we have this um, homomorphic encryption uh, version of our um, updating function, uh, uh, we can start the um, multi-party computation protocol um, where step one is actually a distributed key generation. So uh, in this case, we make use of a distributed um, private key. So um, simply stated, uh, so it, it is nice to say that this is actually generated by a secret sharing protocol. Um, and um, you could say that uh, we have a public key that can only be um, uh, opened by uh, combining the distributed private keys. Um, so using a distributed key generation, uh, um, we make sure that every bank has one of the distributed private keys uh, and we have this um, uh, public key. So then, what the banks can do, they can 
compute uh, the encrypted um, updated well sorry um So the banks can encrypt the risk score. So in this case, you see that bank A can encrypt a risk score of A and um, bank two uh, of B and C. Um, and um, then bank, a, bank one and bank two can uh, send their encrypted scores to bank three. And Bank three receives them. Of course, this happens also the other way around, but I focus now on the uh, calculation of the updated score of um, D. So once D has received these scores, it can use this new uh, formula to calculate the updated score of uh, D, and it ends up with a uh, decrypted version of, of uh, or an encrypted version of this updated score. And then we can start the step of decryption of the updated scores. Um, so this happens uh, um, through a round. Well, in the, in actually it happens a little bit differently, but this is just visual <laughs> to visualize it. Um, uh, bank three can send the uh, the encrypted score of D to bank two. It, the, bank two can partially decrypt this score using its own key, send it to bank A. Bank A can decrypt its uh, uh, that part, send it to bank D, uh, bank three, and uh, bank three ends up with the new score of account D, and it sees this score is one third and um, can use this score for further uh, transaction monitoring. So in the end, what we have reached is that uh, Bank 3 can see the updated score of account D without exactly knowing the inputs A, B and C. Um, so this brings us to result two. Um, we see that a secure version of risk propagation is possible, and we also tested that it is scalable. Here you see a picture of the scalability in the number of nodes. Um, and in general, banks can update risk scores on the combined transaction network while protecting the privacy of their customers by only sharing uh, encrypted scores. Um, so the conclusion of this talk is that we showed the feasibility of a collaborative privacy preserving money laundering detection model. Um, however, as any research, I would say this is no silver bullet and we need a lot of uh, technical future research. So um, first of all, what I presented now is a passive, passively secure model and we are working on uh, how we can do it active, secu active securely. Um, and also it is not quantum safe yet, so we want to work towards quantum security. This could, for example, be done using a different homomorphic encryption protocols or um, secret sharing, for example. Um, and then um, there are still a lot of legal and ethical questions around this research. So um, first of all, the balance between the utility of the output and the privacy of the input. Um, so you could say that uh, suppose you have a network where you calculate all these scores, then uh, because you use linear operations, it might be possible to uh, recalculate uh, some of the input. This can be obfuscated by doing a lot of iterations of the algorithm, for example, um, or only um, revealing certain uh, end results. Um, but this is always a balance, of course. From every output, you can le learn something on the input. Um, so you need to find a balance between how useful it is and how much you keep the input private. Um, so this, I would say, is both a legal question 
uh, but also a mathematical question on how do you uh, exactly um, quantify that um, the utility and the privacy. Uh, another question is uh, accountability. So, um, of course, you cannot look into the source of the results. So if you get a high score, for example, you cannot see where it exactly came from, um, which can be a problem um, in these detection mechanisms, of course. Um, so somehow you need some would need some legal framework around it to, for example, be able to look into the source of, of certain uh, important results. Um, but uh, in general, I think it is a beautiful solution that could help to um, protect the privacy of bank customers. Um, and we are testing this in a pilot this year uh, between two banks. And um, uh, we are also looking at all these legal questions, for example, around it and the technical questions. Um, so I hope to present that result maybe in the next uh, financial crypto uh, conference. Um, well, this was my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Uh, more information on the project that was behind this, um, this research can be found on financialprivacytech.com. Um, and you can always reach me by email or contact me via LinkedIn um, to discuss uh, this topic. Thank you for listening.